It's time for Chess Chest! What? No, 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 no. Chess Chest. Welcome to another Down the Rabbit Hole video, and welcome to another episode of Chess Chest. We've been recently talking about each of the individual pieces, their history, where they come from, all of their backgrounds, everything from the pawn all the way up to the queen and all the guys in between. But now it's all been coming down to the final piece, the last one, the king. <sighs> yeah, this guy is kind of interesting. Uh, he is the slowest piece, maybe with the exception of the pawns. He's actually the whole objective, why we're playing the game to begin with, and he's actually maybe what the game is named after, but we'll, we'll get to that eventually. Um, the king is, to me, always seemed kind of an odd piece. Like, why is it when all of these other guys can race across the board, as I say, except for the pawn, why is the king left kind of this useless, plodding, pedantic little guy? Because, if you don't know chess, the king can move only one square in any direction, ever. There are no uh, unusual circumstances in which he can change that. Even the pawn, who is a lowly, you know, marching along the, the board, even he has, at least at the beginning, the option to go two squares if he wants. There's also the option I talked about when I discussed the pawn, how if he's close to one of the enemies and they move, he can uh, capture them in an en passant move. So, even the pawn seems to be a little more powerful than the king. Why is the king so slow? I have a feeling that's actually due to the original history or the very, very ancient history of the king because what's interesting about this guy, throughout all the different variations of chess, we've talked about how the queen, back when she was the vizier, used to only do a couple of diagonal moves. Um, also, the elephant was similarly restricted in movement. I think the only one that also hasn't really changed over time is the chariot, the rook, being able to like slide across entire uh, columns of the, of the board. But the king, right from day one, has only ever been able to move one square. Now, you could argue, or I guess it's been sort of analyzed well, that's to represent the, um, the slowness of government or, you know, uh, people like to refer to behind every great man is a great woman. Obviously, the queen is a more powerful piece. There's kind of that whole element to it. But for me, when I was learning chess as a kid, it did seem strange to me that the most powerful piece, I mean, certainly, arguably, why we're playing the game to begin with, is this very slow, uh, lumbering sort of character compared to all the others. They've all got these great, awesome moves and things that have changed over time. But the king has remained this one square at a time guy. Now, it's not like he can't use that to his advantage. I might talk to, touch on that later. But I wanted to kind of address, like, as a fan of, say, for example, King Arthur, there have been a lot of iterations of that uh, legend and that character, but he's, he's always been a man of action who's done things. Uh, similarly, if you really like the Game of Thrones series, the idea of kings being able to get things done and have major influence is synonymous with this uh, concept that I always had of, you know, the king should be this big, powerful piece. How come in the game of chess, he's this slow-moving, very pedantic piece? Um, it might be that he's sort of representing the seat of power, and so therefore he doesn't move, he doesn't change much, you could argue that as well. I have a feeling, though, the actual reason that the king is so slow and I talked about this when I sort of delved into the very early days of chess itself. It might have been, I think it is, uh, based on a Chinese game called Shang-Chi. Similar looking board, similar kind of pieces, older than Chaturanga, which is the Indian origin of what we now know as chess. Shang-Chi has at the top the general, or at the bottom, uh, the, the place where the king would be located was, in the Shang-Chi game, the general, or the marshal. And I have a feeling, because in the original game of Shang-Chi, there's this little, it's called a gong, or a, a palace, that's where the, the marshal 
always runs his armies out of. It's sort of his, um, he's the, the designated headquarters of the leader. And from there, he can only move in that tiny little block. He can attack some of the pieces that might be coming in, but he really only has that one limited area of movement. And because Shang-Chi, I think, is the ancestor of what we know of his chess, he, the, the movement of that one central piece at the back file must have migrated across all the different iterations. And so now when we think of the king, we only think of him moving in this small little range. Um, what's an interesting side effect as well from the Shang-Chi rules, if two generals or marshals can see each other across the battlefield, they actually can do this flying martial attack of just going right across and taking him out. And when I think of like the, the Chinese battlefield of old must have been the idea of a, a big central palace that all of the activity, all of the decisions are made out of and the generals are standing up there and shouting their orders. And I guess, I mean, maybe there was something in legend about uh, being able to volley across the troops and be able to take out the king, uh, or, or sorry, the general. That may have been part of Chinese history or something. Certainly it, it's depicted a lot in their films. But that actually brings me to a little side note of in the Shang-Chi, it's not the king. It's the marshal or the general, the person who's running the army. Uh, I talked about how um, Shang-Chi was probably originally created by Han Xin, a general of his army. So the idea of it being royalty or anything to do with the monarchs of China, ancient China, that was never really a thing. So in Shang-Chi, it's not the king and his army. It's the general marshal and his army that's taking place. And with this weird leaping across thing. So to take it from ancient China and the marshals and the generals, the game that came after that was Chaturanga, which is from India, where this piece was the Raja. It was now a king. Similar movement, maybe not the palace, but you know, similar movement, very slow, and all of the different units that work with the, the main piece in Chaturanga. And then when it moved from Chaturanga in India to Shatranj in the Middle East, this piece was now the Shah. And I, as a kid of the 70s, my only knowledge of the Shah was the Shah of Iran. Controversial character, don't want to go into the politics of that much, but that name, when I read up on these pieces and I heard, oh yeah, the king used to be called the Shah, I was like, oh yeah, like the Shah of Iran. Okay, I get it now. This is the Middle Eastern king. Now, the name of the Shah has actually resonated through different versions of chess. And I had a very interesting experience when, about 15 years ago, in an old job of mine, I had a little chess board thing, and I would, you know, play out little puzzle pieces, I'd, 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 I can't remember, I think it was like a daily calendar of like, here's a puddle, here's a, here's a chess puzzle, see if you can solve it in two or three moves or whatever. So I'd have this, you know, little travel case thing, and I'd leave the pieces there, and when, when I had a spare moment to sort of think, or if I wanted to change my perspective to, to have a, a nice way of thinking about stuff, I'd look at this puzzle piece and I'd go, hmm, how do you get that in two moves? And what's interesting is, a guy who sat across from me in his cubicle was from Croatia, and he would sometimes look over and go, hmm, yeah, okay, there's the Shah, and there's this piece, and I'll be like, oh, he was using older terminology than I'm used to, that's interesting. And even in this, uh, this series that I've done, I've had people from different parts of Europe tell me, oh yeah, we, we call this the, the, the Rocco, and we call this the horse. What's this knight stuff about? That's a very British connection for, for chess. So um, the Shah, I was quite surprised when I heard this coworker of mine saying that. And what's also interesting is he did refer to what we call checkmate, when the king is finally placed in that, in the old version in Shatranj, and this co-worker of mine, they both mentioned Shah Mat. Mat being a der derivation of Mata, possibly, uh, meaning the king is dead. Now, Shah Mat is actually the idea that the king is bewildered or thrown off or like that's the the actual original phrase is shamat means the king has been uh, defeated but not necessarily he's dead mata is the um, ancient arabic word i believe it is for being killed so 
Shah Mata, the king is dead, actually became confused with Shah Mat, meaning the king is just bewildered or thrown off or confused, and that made the victory condition of Shatranj being when the Shah is defeated with way, whichever way you want to do it. Shah Mat just became that phrase that was used in Shatranj. Interestingly, that moved with the game as it came into Europe, and a variety of terms began to modify that phrase, shamat. We actually know it today as checkmate. And that, that actually filters throughout a lot of our language. And it's actually all based on check, uh, uh, chess. Funny I should mention check. Let's, let's actually go into where the names began to change and how chess came into Europe. I've mentioned this book before, it's an awesome resource, A History of Chess by H.J.R. Murray. This thing has been an incredible read for me because it goes into a lot of this information and it talks about things that are just really fascinating to me. Among which, if we go to page 356, of several Europeans going into the Middle East, there's a discussion in here from the Dane George Host. And then his discussion about Morocco, he's talking about the differences in the Middle Eastern culture and philosophy. He talks about how the games of chance are prohibited in the second and fifth chapters of the Quran. So nobody's going to be playing anything that has any dice rolling or any kind of exchange of money going on in the Middle East. And here's the important part. They call the king a Shek, the queen, Ayala, the Rook, Arak, etc., etc. But there's that word, a shek. Pay attention to that because that actually comes up a few times in this. And on the following page, H.J.R. Murray brings up the, a chess problem book, much like I described before. Uh, it was written by Philip Stamma, and it was the essay sur de jeu a checs. Now, my pronunciation of French is terrible, but pay attention to both of those words. King on the previous page was called a shek. And on this page, there's another reference to a very similar word, a shex. This is one of my favorite bits on page 396. They talk about how the word shah, which we described earlier, actually gets adjusted and modified when it comes to Europe. They couldn't quite wrap their tongue around that sh sound, a shah, or however the correct way would be to pronounce it in an Arabic tongue. And the sh sound became more of a sk sound. Um, there's a description here, page 396 and 397. Uh, European words were pronounced skak, skakus, or where is that other one? Um, yeah, skakus, which is of English origin. There's a really good uh, little table here that talks about how on phonetic grounds, it seems certain that skak, skakus, skakum, were in Latin by the 9th century. The development of these words, the plural forms, skachi and the verb escacare, I think, or maybe that's skacare, in the Romantic languages, has followed regular lines, and the difference of form between skak, skakum, and skakus has naturally disappeared. Thus we have, in Latin, you've got skak, and then in Italian, or Catalan, it's more skachus, or sketch. Then it goes into Italy and it becomes scacco. When it becomes provincial, it's escac. Middle French has a chèque, that word we saw before. Modern French is a chèque. Anglo French is escheck. And English, check. So, in a nutshell, H.J.R. Murray is saying that, to cut a very long story short, Shah became Czech as it moved through Europe. So that's kind of what I was talking before about how this game is literally the game of kings. Chess, as we understand it, came from Czech and a Czech, the Shah. It's not quite as simple as that. There's actually a really good passage here. I'll, I'll limit how much of this I'm reading out. But on page 400, there's a really good section where 
It is almost a commonplace of modern writers to paraphrase chess and ludus scacorum as the royal game, as though this were the real meaning of the name. It is, of course, true that the original meaning of the word, shah, in Persian is king. But so far as the European word chess is concerned, we must adopt a more democratic note. There is no allusion to the chess king or any single type of chess man. The name chess includes the whole estate of the chess men with whom the game is played. Now, I went through a few uh, paragraphs here with H.J.R. Uh, Murray because I thought at first, oh my god, the name chess, a shek, sketchy, all of that is the origin or originated from Shah. And so therefore, the king, the Shah, is actually where we get the name chess. Not true. Uh, the shek and the sheks. There's a whole etymology that could make this entire video go on for far too long. I might actually do a separate video just about those names because there's actually one final thing I do want to touch upon that I thought was really cool when I was reading this book. On page 419, we possess a Latin poem of English authorship, the Winchester poem, which was written in the first half of the 12th century. The 12th century! While the historian, William of Malmesbury, writing around 1140, also mentions chess. That chess must have been familiar to the Norman kings in the 11th century is clear from the fact that from about 1100, they used the name of the chessboard, Skakarium, also as S. Checker, for the name of the Department of the State in England and in Normandy, which dealt with the collection and administration of the royal revenues. The name of the exchequer, which H.G.R. Murray here talks about, is an ignorant corruption of Middle English exchequer, has survived to the present day in England as the name of the modern descendants of the Norman office. And when I lived in England, I quite often pe heard people talk about the Chancellor of the Exchequer. I knew that was fin finance and banking and essentially part of the Department of Finance. And I remember thinking to myself when I was reading this book, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about the king and Eshek and Skatchi and all that kind of stuff actually being directly related to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and all that banking stuff that I know? That seems incredible. Turns out it's true. Uh, there was in England a large table that they actually would move pieces around that would indicate people's finances, who had to pay what and where varying funds were all placed at. And the name of the Office of the Exchequer, which we now, which has now descended into modern British life and is used quite a lot, actually came from this checkerboard layout. And that was actually derived from chess. So it's really cool to me. There's even a whole section I could go into where the writing of a check, what we refer to in that regard, is directly connected to that financial connection of the checkerboard, which was used because it was very similar. It reminded a lot of people in finance of the chessboard. And that comes from a shek and sketchy, and that's the origin of the shah, and that is the king. <laughs> right, so that's a pretty fascinating turn of events for what we would like to just pedantically refer to as this, this slow-moving guy who really has a lot of his own issues. He's very, um, he does have his powerful uses. The whole game is sort of aimed for him, but you would think, well, the king's kind of pointless and useless outside of that little realm, isn't it? No, this whole game is actually not just with him as the focus, but it actually mm, sort of got part of its name from that, as we described in the book. A chess, which is the French version of this whole thing, is not necessarily named after the king, but it is to do with the whole royal game, which is what the king is kind of the central part about. And a chess, chess that we understand today, it came from all of this stuff. I know I'm not really being very clear, but it's kind of the way the book goes into all that etymology, all that history of the words, it's fascinating stuff. So. It, it just, it seemed to me that um, in, in reviewing and thinking about the king and his role on the board, 
I always kind of had a niggling feeling of like, well, he's kind of slow, kind of boring. These other pieces have got so much more dynamic stuff that they're going on about, which is true. But it all comes back to the king, the shah, the raja. And the chess game lends a lot of its name and a lot of its terminology and the influence that it has had. Like with the Department of the Exchequer, Chancellor of the Exchequer, writing a check. All of those things, our very, our very use of the word check, well, you make sure you check on that or what have you, it actually comes from the chess game because of all of this stuff. So yeah, a really good book. I love, I love what H.J.R. Murray goes into with this stuff, um, but I, I probably have not communi communicated it very clearly. It's a lot of words to get through and a lot of um, language that I don't quite grasp. Anyway, so that is The King. This is the end of this episode of Chess Chest. I'm actually kind of relieved because it's been fascinating and I have loved going into the history of each of these guys and the board itself. I even talked about that in one of the earliest episodes. I think what I'd like to do is kind of relax with the next episode of Chess Chest and just talk about like some of my direct experiences and maybe not quite have such of the so much of the dry historical stuff. Let's let's bump it up and make it a little bit more fun. So the next episode of Chess Chest is going to be a little more lighthearted, shorter, and probably more enjoyable to make. Definitely not as much reading through some complicated stuff in an old book. I'll leave it there. Until next time, we'll see you down the rabbit hole.